Welcome to the 13th lecture for regulatory frameworks for environmental management and planning. In this lecture, we are really doing a course synthesis and reflection and talk about some future directions. So this is the last lecture in our course. We've had 12 lectures covering particularly the planning framework in Queensland, the mining, calcium gas, uh, pollution, environmental harm, laws, uh, nature conservation, water management, Commonwealth environment laws and climate change. And last week, you recall, we looked at professional duties, ethics in the courts. So just pulling it together. Now, when I taught this course in the past, I tended in, in the final lecture to review the 12 lectures in the course and go through a few key slides from it, look at you know what each lecture uh, covered and then run through the key points. On reflection though, I think this adds little to what we've already covered and it becomes repetitive and boring. And so I want to take a different approach today and I want to keep this lecture deliberately uh, short. I'm conscious that in several lectures have gone um, five or ten minutes over time and I want to just try and pull that back so that uh, this lecture gives you back a bit of that time that I've used a bit too much of in previous lectures because I'm, I'm really conscious of your time and how precious precious it is. So in this lecture I want to give a brief course review and really a big picture synthesis and yeah, drawing together a few key themes of the course and really look at where we've come from and where we've gotten to in this course and then uh, I want to in the second part of the course really look to your futures and uh, not only using the knowledge that you've gained through the course but more broadly tips for surviving in your careers. So I find teaching this course hard both technically and emotionally. I find it technically challenging because there's a lot of complex and frankly confusing content that regularly changes and needs to be explained in simple comprehensive ways. So things like the Planning Act is regularly changing and planning schemes are regularly changing. So in preparing and delivering the course I look across that and look at uh, how can I synthesize this in this complex confusing system in a manageable way. I'm not going to say I've I explain it in a simple way uh, because this complex confusing system is just that and we can't make the complex and confusing reality too simple or we lose sight of you know, really what it, how difficult it is to deal with in practice and I didn't want to dumb it down to the point where you're just learning a few simple rules that you, you know, and then saying you'll all be okay if you, if you can do this. So this course has been hopefully much more than that for you and you've learnt some important skills that you can apply in your careers, things like statutory interpretation, understanding how complex planning schemes are, even if in your career you don't deal with them directly. So if you're not a town planner and you're not working in the DA system, then uh, there's still lots of areas where uh, planning schemes will impact on you. Uh, and I hope that it's useful to understand the, the complexity of the system for you. So technically, I find this a challenging and hard course to deliver. Emotionally, I also find it hard because the content of this course matters. It will dramatically affect your careers and your lives and the lives of the people and places you love. And its failures will affect billions of lives and countless species for millennia into the future. So the context of our course, we started in lecture one acknowledging that there had just been these catastrophic bushfires in Australia that were substantially driven by climate change. And so that overshadowed the start of the course and talked about how really it was unbelievable over Christmas that we had Australians sheltering on beaches from massive bushfires, fleeing their homes and holiday homes and really making climate change a reality in the present tense, not something we can put off to the future. 
So that part of the context at the start was also that the Great Barrier Reef was on the brink of a third uh, major coral bleaching event. And yeah, it was the third major bleaching event in five years. And then during the course that actually played out and the GBR experienced that massive bleaching event. So that's overshadowed the course. And the context as well of that is that our government talks of adaptation and resilience and technology over taxation, but never talks about the costs of inaction. And the bushfires and coral bleaching really show us those costs. So these impacts are symptoms of a global, national and state government and legal failure to protect us and our environment. And on climate change, this quote from Winston Churchill from 1936 is really apt. They, our government, go on in a strange paradox, decided only to be undecided, resolved to be irresolute, adamant for drift, solid f for fluidity, all-powerful to be impotent. Now, in this context as well, we've obviously had coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, really blow the whole world into a different dimension with travel restrictions uh, and yeah, major impacts and lots of people dying around the world. Massive um, societies being dislocated. It's horrible to see what's happening in the US right now, in Brazil, in Latin America, uh, through uh, Southeast Asia, particularly Indonesia, uh, and you know, many other countries where coronavirus is still ravaging the population and it's going to take a long time to, yeah, to, um, I'm not sure if return to normality is the right phrase because what will be normal after this is going to be different to what, it, what was normal beforehand. So we're still in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, although in Australia, and in some parts of the world where um, the restrictions on imposed by governments have been relatively successful, it can feel like it's a, it's a distant uh, problem, but you only need to look at the news to see that in many parts of the world, it is still a huge, huge problem. And of course, in the US, it's sort of descending at the moment, it seems, into chaos with um, yeah, the riots over police uh, killings of um, African Americans. So it's, yeah, it's, coronavirus has had a big impact on the world during the, our course. And yet reflecting on, you know, what have we learned from coronavirus? To me, one of the big questions when we think about climate change is, well, where is the COVID-19 attitude of stuff the economics, whatever it takes, we're going to, we're going to do this, we're going to fix this, we're going to stop this from happening. So there's no COVID-19 attitude in our government for solving climate change. In fact, it's the opposite. It's put the economics first, don't do anything that impacts on our short-term economic prospects and jobs and basically stuff the future so short-term gain, long-term cost. So that was the big picture of the factual context of our course. And I said at the outset and a couple of times through the course that you can think of teaching and learning in a complex course like this as something like a game of chess. So there's lots of pieces that are moving and hopefully in your own minds there's also lots of pieces that are moving um, things that you learn or gain skills in that then make other parts uh, make sense and that you can basically build up your knowledge and skills in a comprehensive way or at least in you can feel confident that you have some core skills that you can apply through your careers so the course, in terms of the big parts of it, from my perspective, the course has had about five um, major uh, things that I've been uh, using or deploying to help you learn. So there's the lectures. We've had 
13 lectures, including this one, where I've tried to give you a an introduction to important topics within environmental regulation. And we've had tutorials, which have been linked to the lecture content in part, but have really focused mostly on helping you with the group assignment. So that's linked in with the assessment. Uh, so you know that the assessment had, and the, the assessment had uh, the big group assignment with 40% where you prepared to develop an application and that was also linked with the field trips. So there were two field trips. One, we went to uh, UQ Childcare Centre and we were looking at the development application for the Childcare Centre being built a few years ago and looking at um, PD Online, Brisbane City Council website in tutorials. And then on the second field trip, we went out to the site that we were developing uh, out uh, on the Darling Downs and yeah, took some pictures, kicked the dirt, looked around at it and then that linked into what you're working on in the group assignment. So the lectures and tutorials and field trips and the group assignment were all interlinked and were intended to help you understand the complexity of the development assessment system where there is a lot of work uh, for you potentially in your careers, whether you're a town planner, environmental manager, environmental scientist or engineer or even occupational health and safety or an, you know, other, other discipline. There's a lot of work in that area and it's very complex and yeah, you can either work in the private sector or you can work for government. And in lectures we covered things like, well, planning schemes and the DA system. But the group assignment, I hope the big thing that you got out of that was, hey, this is really complex. When you actually look at a planning scheme, working out what's going on, this massive document, definitions, all these tables, th there's a lot in this. So that's what I really wanted you to get out of um, the group assignment linked with the lectures and the tutorials. The other big part of the... Um, components of the course is which is still to come is the online exam which is worth 60 percent we've talked about that in the last few tutorials uh, in preparing for it and uh, yeah it, uh, it's got multi-choice questions some short answer and some problem solving uh, essays uh, so covering across what you've what we've covered in the lectures uh, in particular and the skills that I hope that you take from this course. There's also been some um, voluntary online quizzes that uh, I created which could give you feedback that were just formative and uh, hopefully they've been useful for you in locking down some of the core concepts around development in particular and condition making powers as well and you'll get the benefit out of those quizzes because uh, on the online exam, there's going to be some multi-choice questions for both courses that will, at least many of them, will reflect what, you, what you're what you already familiar with from those online quizzes. So those different parts, from my perspective, were intended to work together to help you understand this complex regulatory system. So, as I said, COVID-19 loomed large over the world during our course. And in response, we adapted to fully online learning and I think we stayed on track. So I hope that that's your feeling as well. Like I, I really enjoyed delivering the lectures in person and it's really nice to see your faces and get an instant reaction and delivering them over Zoom is, is yeah, not as nice. Uh, similarly, the tutorials for internal students uh, it's nice to be there and be able to walk around and talk with you and everyone do their own thing and you know have a tutor walking around so that we can help you in person. But I still think that we've managed the group assignment and the tutorials in a useful way for you without really being blown offline by moving fully online. So and particularly for you know many students were taking this course externally anyway. So. Um, the on moving to fully online really didn't change how the course is delivered for you. The only significant change for external students is really the uh, online exam rather than having a um, two-hour open book exam. So while uh, COVID-19 has 
you know, affected so many parts of your university experience. I hope that you feel that with this course, it's been as good really as uh, it could have been and you've enjoyed it and you feel that, yeah, we've, we've managed it successfully. Because I'd also say that, you know, working online is basically what you do uh, in the workforce now anyway. Like, um, you know, all of my work moved online, but I already did a lot of things with Zoom conferences anyway, talking with solicitors in Papua New Guinea and Sydney, as well as even in Brisbane. So the things we've been doing in the course in terms of Zoom conferences, uh, they're really what a modern workplace uh, now exists in any way. So hopefully also those are, again, uh, useful skills for your work, work, working lives. So our 13 lectures, I won't go through them individually, but just to recap broadly. So a lot of the lecture topics were built around understanding the planning system. So the first three, so after our introductory I'll just change this to my pointer. So our first three lectures, substantive ones, or lectures two, three, and four, as you know, were all built around understanding the Planning Act. So we looked at planning schemes, which is a major limb of the whole planning framework. And we also looked at um, statutory interpretation skills in that lecture. And then in lecture three, we looked at the development assessment system, and we learned all of those um, what would have been at the time, if you hadn't dealt with them before, confusing concepts like material change of use, uh, reconfiguring a lot, operational works. So we learned about those different um, concepts as well as the different parts of the DA system, like an application, referral, um, public notification, and then decision stages and appeals. So that system, um, that we learned about in lecture three, we're also getting familiar with through the group assignment in actually preparing a development application and looking at a real planning scheme. So lectures two and three were linked with lecture four, which in which we looked at conditions and development offences. And conditions I really wanted to emphasise is such an important part of the system. If you're working uh, you know, for a mine or for any site that's subject to a development approval, uh, complying with the conditions is can be a major component of your work. If you're, a, say, you're an environmental manager or an environmental scientist working for a company, then compliance with conditions is yeah a major part of uh, your working lives. And so we've I really wanted to emphasise um, condition making powers. Uh, we moved on from those first three lectures on the planning framework to look at mining and environmental impact assessment in lecture five. And you remember we looked at that um, big uh, mine out on the Darling Downs, the New Ackland mine that we also visited um, briefly during the field trip to the Darling Downs. In lecture six, we looked at calcium gas, ports and major infrastructure projects, and then uh, lecture seven, environmental harm and pollution, uh, lecture eight, nature conservation, vegetation management, and then water management, fisheries and cultural heritage, Commonwealth environment laws, climate change, and lastly, professional duties, ethics and the courts. So we've covered a lot of ground. A lot of the lectures, uh, you know, linked back to the um, DA system. So when we looked at water management and fisheries, uh, a lot of the works that go on that affect those are linked back into the DA system. And similarly, vegetation management is linked back into the DA system. So the introductory lectures helped us to understand those later topics. And you can't really work, uh, yeah, you ca really can't work in Queensland in any, any aspect of development or really mining without understanding those uh, broad frameworks uh, around the development assessment system. So those are the, well, that's what we've covered in the lectures. In tutorials, uh, as I've already mentioned, they were linked particularly uh, early on. They were linked to the group assignment and preparing the development application. So we looked at a lot of different online databases like um, council websites, the um, different state government planning websites, and how to search them for you know interrogating them for a particular development on a particular parcel of land. So. Uh, that was the f 
major chunk of our tutorials. And then in week 10, well, we had a, we had a um, pause one week while we were wrapping up the development application. In week 10, we moved on to practicing statutory interpretation. And in the last couple of weeks, we've practiced past exams to help prepare for the online exam coming up. And this week, we're going to practice an online exam as well. So one of the actual benefits, surprising benefits of um, moving fully online that I didn't plan initially, but uh, we're able to develop. Um, and if I was to ever to teach this course again, I'd really want to keep it because I thought it was great was having pre-lodgement meetings for the group assignment. So most people met with Revel Poynton uh, online and talked about what you're proposing to do and got feedback and were able to ask, yeah, Revel a lot of questions, really on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I was really so happy to be able to do that for you because if we hadn't had uh, essentially coronavirus push us all online, Revel's time would have been really there for the online, basically for delivering the tutorials, and uh, we wouldn't have had pre-lodgement meetings for each in, in, each individual group, including for external groups. So I was really happy with yeah with that, and I hope that you felt the pre-lodgement meetings were really helpful for you to understand and get feedback on you know understand the whole process and get feedback on your application uh, before you lodged it. So, yeah, I thought that that was actually really, really beneficial. Then in terms of the assessment, we had the group assignment and the focus there was about understanding the complexity of the DA process and planning schemes. And now we've still got to come the online exam worth 60%. The focus in the online exam is on problem solving. There's no abstract or theoretical essay writing questions. It's all given a set of facts. Uh, apply a principle or give advice to a client on some aspect of particularly the DA process and conditions. Uh, so they're the real focus focuses for the online exam. And again, I'm really wanting to focus on things that will be really useful for you in professional practice in your first couple of years. So that's why, yeah, the online exam focuses on those topics. So as I mentioned, we're going to have a practice online exam, which will be available from 9 a.m. tomorrow for seven days. And I'd suggest you join your, no your normal tutorial times for an overview tomorrow. And then in a week's time on the 9th of June for a discussion about it. So uh, I really, uh, because it's an online exam like this is new for you, but it's also new for essentially all staff, uh, in the past, you know, we've, I'm used to essentially handing over an exam to the examination section, which they then deliver. They, you know, have the venue, they um, hand it out, they collect it, and I then get it and mark it. Whereas an online exam is very different from a delivery perspective. And uh, yeah, so making sure that the technology actually works, that it runs smoothly, that there's no glitches for you. Uh, all of those things I want to make sure are, are all ironed out before the actual online exam uh, in a couple of weeks time. So the practice uh, will both give you experience in essentially writing uh, and completing an online exam um, for this course. And it also is going to give me an important chance to make sure the technology is working properly before you know, before delivering it live where uh, it counts for you for marks. So I want to ensure that everything, uh, yeah, runs smoothly for you. So, uh, yeah, have a go at that in the next uh, week. So the big picture of this course, if I could, if you take away one analogy for environmental regulation, it's this. Think of the law and environmental regulation like a jigsaw that you need to solve. So there's many different pieces and solving any particular problem involves identifying the relevant bits and bringing them together to build up the picture of you know, the answer for your client or if you're working for government, uh, for, for the government. And continuing that, or extending that um, analogy of thinking of it like a jigsaw, the 
uh, diagram that I've given you in a handout back in lecture one uh, and also in that little textbook synopsis of the Queensland Environmental Legal System. This diagram of thinking about the environmental legal system in Queensland in four layers, international law at the top, commonwealth or national laws, then Queensland law and the common law. I hope you find that useful as a uh, conceptual framework uh, for your careers because, uh, yeah, it's often, you know, this whole system is complex and confusing and it defies neat categories. So I have tried to avoid using categories like um, planning law or um, nature conservation or... Um, you know, fisheries, I have used them to an extent in titles, but the thing that I really wanted to emphasize is while those common categories, you need to be aware of them because they're in everyday use. Like if someone talks about fisheries law or planning law, you've got a basic idea what they mean. Those, those basic categories are useful, but only for simplistic understandings of the system and they're quite dangerous to lock yourself into thinking of the regulatory system in neat categories because there are no neat categories they all often overlap and are interlinked so as an example uh, planning the planning system is intricately interlinked with nature conservation so when a local government decides that it's going to leave an area zoned um, for rural use or for even for nature conservation or open space, or they decide that another area is going to be developed for a town, then those decisions that the local government makes and that are implemented through its planning scheme and then through the DA system, those have big imp impacts on biodiversity in that local government area. So nature conservation isn't just about national parks. It isn't just about you know, international law like the Ramsar Convention or the Biodiversity Convention. It's this interlinked um, system of international obligations, national laws, as well as the state laws, both the planning system, legislation like the Nature Conservation Act and the like. Now, in the topics for lectures, I've often used the basic um, categories like, you know, a, a lecture that focused on nature conservation and vegetation management. But I've always emphasized in those lectures, don't be locked into these as categories because they're all interlinked. So if you think of the regulatory system like a jigsaw and you've got to identify the relevant bits to solve and build up the picture, then I think that's a really powerful metaphor to use um, going forward because this whole system is a witch's brew of complex technical issues overlapping complex confusing often so you've got the technical difficulties of dealing with things so if we think about say local government planning and um, bushfire management and adaptation to climate change so a local government in reviewing its planning scheme, it might be concerned about, you know, bushfire management. It's also concerned about how bushfires are changing because of climate change. So those all go into the review and that makes for a very complex and difficult technical question about how you, how the local government should um, control development to deal with issues like bushfires and climate change. So those are difficult technical issues. They're also um, technical and difficult legally because how do you then control it through the DA system? You've got all of these different concepts about material change of use, operational works and the like. And all of this is how the system actually works in practice. So it's a, I call it a witch's brew of complex technical issues and within that whole system as well we've got huge ethical challenges for how we think and how we operate as professionals you know do there's a, a big emphasis in you know in private practice on giving the client what they want 
and you know people talk about well you shouldn't be a hired gun and and no one is going to admit that they're a hired gun just doing what the client wants but there is a huge practical pressure on you to deliver because if the client's paying you you know ten twenty thousand dollars to write a report on to support their development application then you know what the client wants and you know they're not going to be very happy with you and you probably won't get any more work for them if you don't basically support their um, application so yeah the ethical challenges with being involved in this overall system and then you know if you're working for local government or state government the political pressures to decide uh, and approve developments as well there's a huge ethical challenges within this whole system so don't be naive i've said this many times about the overall regulatory system don't be naive in assuming that the law will actually protect the environment there's often a big gap between what the law says on paper and how it's implemented and environmental protection is hard won and never certain and i gave you another metaphor back in lecture one of thinking about what we're trying to achieve and recognizing that we want jobs and employment we want housing we want peace and security we want clean food and water we want public health we want strong families and communities and i use the category of happiness as well for things like the arts and being able to go into nature and um, you know having a, a world that we enjoy living in so those are things that we want as a society and good governance and justice maintaining nature and education all of these things are the roots for how we deliver those outcomes the sort of fruit of the tree are the outcomes that we want to achieve and it all depends upon good governance and justice education and ultimately maintaining a healthy natural system because if we don't do that then yeah the tree dies um, you know jobs and employment they might be short term but they're not going to be long term and yeah the society isn't one that we want to live in if you know you've got a highly degraded polluted um, system where your fisheries have collapsed and you know a lot of your farmland um, you can't use because it's toxic or you know too bushfire prone or whatever reason so a good society is going to be sustainable and it's going to maintain nature so that underpins it so another big picture point and an, another point i made right at the start was that this course is about giving you the practical knowledge and skills to navigate the maze of laws that protect the environment dur during your professional careers and i particularly wanted to focus on the first couple of years of your careers and the things that really what I um, in my mind or what I'm thinking of is when I think about the content for this course is what are the skills you need to know to walk into an office either in government or in private practice uh, as a town planner environmental manager uh, engineer you know going into a consultancy and uh, you're going to work say in the DA system and the mining systems what are the skills that you need to know so that you can do your job at least at a you know basic level from the start and you're not going to be embarrassed by your boss says you know you start work as a town planner and your boss says you know we've just had a new client um, they want to prepare a development application can you prepare the the basic report and the DA forms you know I want you to know where you can find the DA forms you've had a crack at you know doing them before you can have a crack at um, preparing a report that looks good that's going to be able to be submitted and you're not going to be embarrassed um, by not being able to find or work your way around a planning scheme or you know basic things in the planning legislation so that's what i've been thinking of in thinking about the content of this course what are the skills you need to know for the first couple of years not the stuff you know 10 years down the track that you'll be doing you know if you you're in charge of rewriting a new planning scheme or you're a manager in a state government doing about you know doing a policy review in this new major policy initiative well all of that stuff you will learn on the job you'll have a lot of people around you will you will learn them 
you know, when you need to. But what are the things you need to know as a foundation for your career? And ultimately, I hope that, well, I hope two things. First, I really hope that you have had fun and enjoyed this course, uh, despite the COVID-19 disruptions. So I hope that you enjoyed your group assignment and saw that it was useful. And secondly, I hope that you also see what you've learned is important and useful for your professional careers, because I'm conscious that a lot of people in the course are only here because it's a core course. And uh, a lot of people, I'm sure, you know, wouldn't have done this course if you know you had a choice but i hope now that you've basically completed it or nearly completed it subject to the online exam that you can see actually it's really useful and you're glad you've done it okay so that's a broad review of the course and synthesis of some of the key themes and i didn't want to you know i didn't want to go back over the lecture content in any more detail than that i want to move on just really briefly for some tips for surviving in your careers and five strategies. So this is, um, yeah, I thought about whether to talk about this for this final lecture and decided to because I suppose I, you know, 20 years ago, I was an undergraduate student and I suppose now with the experience of surviving uh, in a professional career, I want to look back and maybe give you some ideas for how you survive in your careers because a lot of people fall off along the way. And in thinking about this, I'm thinking particularly about who is in this course. So for our undergraduate course in the M3103, about 30% are Bachelor of Environmental Management students, 20% are Bachelor of Regional Town Planning, 20% are engineering students, about 13% are environmental science students, and then we've got 8% occupational health and safety, and uh, about 10% or 6% of other um, courses exchange and other degrees. So I'm particularly thinking about you guys doing environmental management, town planning, engineering, and environmental science, uh, and the careers that you're going to have. And also for our postgraduate course, about 60% environmental management, and 30% town planning. So for your careers, um, the context of your careers is very much climate change. We've talked about in this course and you know a lot about. And the context, an important part of that context is this, that even in the face of clear catastrophic impacts of climate change, political inaction persists and there's no emergency action taken to address the cause, only the symptoms. And we treat going higher from our current one degree mean global temperature rise to two degrees as no big deal. We sh we're shifting the entire distribution of global temperatures and that has a big impact on the extreme. So even at our current levels of one degree of mean global temperature rise, we're experiencing extremes in fire, in temperature, in many other um, aspects of the impacts. So the extremes are hugely damaging for our society. And it's, yeah, this shift in the temperature distribution, which is yeah, going to have huge implications for your careers, whether you're a town planner, environmental manager, or an engineer. It's going to affect both your day-to-day -day work as well as your long-term uh, job prospects. So there's going to be a lot of job opportunities in solving um, climate change, both in mitigation and adaptation. So big implications for your career and job opportunities for you. And we can draw lessons from COVID-19. I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, where is the COVID-19 response? to climate change and it's true it's not there right now but the lesson that we can draw from COVID-19 for environmental regulation is that it's going to shift massively during your careers often rapidly and in response to disasters so we don't have it right now but think about COVID-19 you know like six months ago who would have thought who would have thought 
that the whole global transportation system built around pretty well unfettered air travel would shut down virtually overnight. Like within a month, the whole globe basically closed down and we're still very restricted in international travel. And the isolation that's come, you know, the, the forced lockdowns that have occurred in Australia and in many, many countries. Who would have thought that like six months ago? I, I certainly, if someone had said that that was going to happen or even possible, I would have just said no way. So, but yet, yet it's happened. And this massive shift occurred virtually overnight. And if we think about what's coming with climate change, it's going to be like this. There's going to be massive shifts during your careers and then they're often going to be rapid and in response to disasters. We don't have them yet, but they'll come. So then thinking about how to survive in your careers, I just wanted to talk about five strategies. So the first strategy I'd suggest for you in surviving in your careers is be kind to yourself and remember why you started your journey. And I just want to tell you a little story about a friend of mine. Uh, his name was uh, Jared Harris, and I grew up with him when I was a, a little kid going to primary school. Uh, he was a really nice uh, friend, played a lot together on the beach. we would go over to his place and uh, play with his brother Nick, um, and they'd come over to our place, and we'd, yeah, through primary school, grew up with Jared. We did a lot of sailing together in a local sailing club. And yeah, he was a really good friend. And then uh, back about five or seven years ago, I got a call out of the blue from Jared and he had seen something I'd written or had been in an interview or something about environmental regulation and he got in contact and he was in, he'd been teaching in South Korea, teaching English and we had a chat and I said, well, you know, next time you're coming through Brisbane, look us up, we'll, you know, catch up, go out for dinner. And didn't think anything more of it until a friend called me a few months later to say that uh, Jared had committed suicide. And I was just so shocked, uh, so shocked that this friend who, yeah, I'd known as this fun-loving kid, how he could have done that and what had gone so wrong in his life that why he felt that he needed to do that and I have often thought of Jared since and felt really sorry for him and his family and I just think I think about myself and my own failings that I need to be kind to myself and even for the things that I think I do wrong or for the things that go wrong um, Give yourself some slack and yeah, be kind to yourself. Remember why you started your journey. And I think doing that uh, is so, so critical. And yeah, as a lawyer, I often wish I had greater skill so that I could win you know, big cases and stop big and hugely damaging projects like the Adani coal mine in court. So I... You know, was involved in a lot of litigation against, say, the Dani coal mine, and yet it got all of its approvals. And I think, well, maybe if I was a better lawyer, maybe if I did something different, we could have won. We could have stopped it, stopped those approvals. And in that context, I, yeah, while I'd like to be a better lawyer, often the reality that I face is that there is no one else, um, because yeah, the environment doesn't pay um, very well. And so if you want to work to protect the environment, often there's not a lot of money around. So um, most lawyers won't work on things that there's no money to pay them. So often for the sort of big cases I work on, there's really no one else. And so I, I do the best with the limited skills I've got. And I've learned to be kind to myself when I lose and to pick myself up and keep going. And yeah, not to give up. So being kind to yourself, I think, is a really important um, thing, an important strategy for your careers, even when you fail. The second strategy is to see your career as a marathon and not a sprint. 
And I say that because it's really common to see people in the conservation sector come in and work incredibly hard and they keep it up for a few years and then they burn out and drop out. And I don't want that to happen to you. Now, you might not think you're going to work in the conservation sector, but really you could replace conservation sector with really any sector. There's a lot of people that work really hard and, you know, don't take weekends. They, they work incredibly, um, you know, they don't make time for their family. They don't, um, yeah, they ultimately burn out. And I think that's a huge problem for us that you need to um, have strategies for in your career to stop that happening. It's your career isn't going to be over. Like, you know, if you're an undergraduate now, you're not, your career isn't going to be over in like the next two or three years. You hopefully will be going in 30 years time. So your career is more a marathon than a sprint. So you have to basically do things to run that long race. So see your career as a 30 year marathon, not as a one to two year sprint. So approach your work like, you know, you're doing this for the long term. So you've got to sustain yourself. And that links into the third strategy I'd suggest for your careers, which is recharge regularly, uh, get good exercise, spend time with your friends and family and doing the things you love and take weekends off, turn off the news and holidays. That's a pretty strong rule that I have. I try and uh, work nine to five Monday to Friday and avoid environment related things or work things on the weekends because I know um, when I started working as a barrister, uh, that was about three, I was about three years into working as a barrister and I turned around and realized that I hadn't taken any holidays for like the first three years. And I realized that every time Christmas came around, there was always some urgent case that, you know, was, I needed to work on over the Christmas break. And similarly at Easter and other hol normal holiday periods, there was always something urgent that was coming up that I needed to prepare for. So I stopped and I didn't take a break and I, yeah, didn't, just didn't take breaks. And I realized this was really unhealthy and yeah, I was going to burn myself out if I kept that up. So I started to have a strict rule of not working on weekends unless I absolutely had to and also taking uh, a few weeks off at least a year to yeah go and do something with a good break away from work and recharge um, because yeah otherwise you are just working um, constantly and you wear yourself out and also you know, it's not a life you want to live um, there's plenty of uh, really great lawyers around in in brisbane um, who yeah fantastic lawyers better than i am who are working you know, weekends routinely, you know, trial after trial. Um, but if you get to know those people, invariably they um, are on their second or third marriage. Um, you know, they're estranged from their kids. They, they're great at their work, but they don't have a family and they're not really very balanced. And I don't think that that's really positive for them. And it's not something that I wanted to do. And I just warn you against, yeah, that sort of workaholic mentality you need to to take time to exercise spend time with your friends and family and do the things you love so here's just a couple of pictures of me this is uh, over a decade ago now down in Tasmania so I really love hiking this is above Lake Oberon in southwest Tasmania and picture I took a couple of years ago on Strabrook Island with my family playing in the surf on a weekend and here's walking this is uh, a group um, of one of the courses I teach international regulatory frameworks there's me and the class on a walk in Springbrook National Park is part of our course but it's a, a walk that I love to do regularly uh, here's one of the students from another one of those courses on the field trip so Zahn from uh, Indonesia actually Zahn was from Malaysia and she's standing beneath uh, the apron of a waterfall and here's another picture taken by another student. Uh, and I often go down to Springbrook. It's only an hour from Brisbane. And I was down there last weekend. And I love it as a place to go walking. 
And I think it's really important to stay in touch with wonderful places like that and the people that you love. They will recharge you during your career and re remind you um, about what you're working to protect. So I think it's really important to visit these sorts of places regularly. So the fourth strategy that um, I wanted to suggest to you is that it's actually rational to despair in the face of the crises facing the earth. But what we need to do is recognize that, but then move on beyond acceptance to work for positive change despite the potential for failure. So this, in this strategy, I've drawn heavily on the work of Joanna Macy, who is an amazing, uh, insightful US writer who started her writing looking at uh, the threat of nuclear war back in the 60s and 70s and in recent decades has been looking particularly at ecological crises and climate change and she writes about how it's rational to despair in the face of the crisis and crises we face on the earth but we have to move beyond acceptance of that to work for positive change and she one of her books is active hope and she, to summarize that, it's a practice that takes a clear view of reality. So we don't shy away from the fact that we're in real trouble with climate change. We're going to lose things like the Great Barrier Reef. There's going to be huge impacts on our communities from things like um, bushfires and other, yeah, other tremendous impacts. So that's reality. But then identify what we hope will happen and take active steps to help bring about that vision. So work to at least limit the damage that's been done. Even if we can't avoid it totally, you know, what you can work on, you can take positive steps. And hope is an essential part of success and we all need it. And taking action is the best way to keep it alive. Despair and denial have a common outcome of inaction. So if you despair, you know, if you deny climate change is a problem, then you don't need to take any action. But if you despair about climate change, then you also don't need to take any action because you think it's hopeless. So we need to take action. We can't um, either deny it or despair about it. We need to have be somewhere in between where we recognize this big problem and we work on addressing it. And there are reasons for hope. So the energy of young people, they, that's you guys. See, I feel like, you know, well, I am old. And I look around and get a lot of inspiration from the people in this course. So I love the fact that you guys are doing, you know, environmental management, town planning, engineering. Uh, I think if I had my time again and I was back um, as an undergrad, I probably would do uh, chemical engineering and look at um, batteries or some, you know, renewable energy um, resources. That's probably what I could, you know... <laughs> Not that I'm good enough at um, maths to probably to be an engineer, but um, in my, you know, if you think about re reliving your life um, and doing it something else, that's probably what I would do um, now to try and save the world. But um, it's too late for me. I've already, you know, done all the work to be a lawyer and there's plenty of things around that I can do with the skills I've got. So I can't rewind but I get a lot of inspiration out of the people in this course, you know, the environmental managers, environmental managers, town planners, engineers, environmental scientists, and the, you know, the great things that you guys can achieve during your careers. And just looking at this picture, isn't this, <laughs> this um, picture was only taken last year, but doesn't it feel so long ago where we could have a crowd of thousands and thousands and thousands of people all so standing <laughs> shoulder to shoulder shouting, um, so so pre-coronavirus and there's yeah lots of other reasons for hope so the refusal of countries like Kiribati to accept the pressure of rich countries like Australia for them to just shut up and you know not talk about climate change not talk about coal but to fight for their futures those are all reasons for hope and the fifth strategy that I wanted to suggest to you for surviving in your careers is this choose to use the skills and tools that you have to save what you can and choose to fight to protect the people and places you love and related to that it might seem a separate part but I see it as interrelated make a spirit of service part of who you are and your future 
So the background to this and thinking of it as a strategy, and at least I use it as a strategy myself, is this book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. So when I was an undergraduate uh, a few decades ago at UQ, I read this book by Viktor Frankl. It's a classic of world literature. Viktor Frankl was a German Jew who was interned in Auschwitz in World War II and survived. Afterwards, he wrote uh, a book called Man's Search for Meaning. So he was a psychologist and wrote essentially this, created this school of psychology called logotherapy or um, the study of meaning. Um, so he wrote about his experiences in Auschwitz and how when people were stripped of um, their identities, they were made a number, they were treated uh, as non-humans, that fundamentally, the fundamental freedom that humans have is a freedom to choose, a freedom to choose how they respond. And that critical to surviving in those situations is seeing meaning and having something to live for. And he gave an example of uh, people who um, the the prisoners would be given um, cigarettes by uh, the Red Cross, and he said, "If you ever saw and, and the the prisoners used the cigarettes to barter for food from the guards, and they never smoked them themselves." And he said, "If you ever saw someone smoking their own cigarettes, then it was pretty well all over for them because they'd given up. There was they were basically having you know the last." A last pleasure before um, they died and he, he wrote about how he worked with other prisoners to give them meaning and, and identify that even though they were in this terrible situation they had reasons to live for so if they were a father or a, a mother that they need to survive so that they could find their child and make sure that they're okay or if they were a concert pianist that they could go back and and um, deliver a fantastic symphony. There, there was a reason for them to keep living. So his uh, basic idea and basic principle is identifying meaning and what you're doing is a core of um, yeah, who you are and uh, surviving. And we have great um, examples great pathfinders for giving meaning and um, fighting for uh, communities. So people like Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela. And I love this quote from Nelson Mandela. And I think about it in, in the context of climate change. He said, every important change in history was, import it was impossible until it happened. So we need to fight for the future we want. Being nice, expecting others to be reasonable, and then our governments will take action to prevent dangerous climate change. It's, it's not working at present. It's clearly not working. And we need to have the same attitude as people like Winston Churchill um, giving a speech in 1941 in the dark depths of World War II when... Um, England was about to be invaded or thought they were about to be invaded by Nazi Germany, saying, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets, and we shall fight in the hills, and we shall never surrender. Well, we need to do that for climate change. And in this context, I don't mean fighting in terms of active acts of aggression. I mean fighting in refusing to passively accept unacceptable outcomes and actively working to avoid those outcomes through any non-violent political, public and personal actions available to you. So don't accept unacceptable behaviour or government policies. And yeah, take a spirit of service. Um, make, make a spirit of service part of who you are and what you, your future is going to be. Um, and in this context, I... Th I just mentioned that service may seem out of date in a world overflowing with naked self-interest, but you can choose the life you want to live. So when I think of naked self-interest, you only got to you know, think of the current um, 
person who's in the White House in the US um, for the epitome of pathological narcissism, self-absorbed um, yeah, ignorance and corruption. Uh, no one even bats an eyelid now that you know everything he does is basically about himself and you know not in the public interest so the idea of service to a person like that seems completely alien but uh, you know i'm hoping that no one aspires to be like that uh, and no one in our class anyway and that you actually want to you know, do good things for the world in your careers. I, I, I think that that must be the case because I can't imagine anyone who studied environmental management, town planning, environmental science, engineering, or occupational health and safety. I just can't imagine why you would be doing, you know, choosing that as your career if you didn't want to help other people. So a spirit of service, this... Um, I think is a really important concept to make a core of who you are in your careers. And I um, saw a presentation a couple of years ago by Richard Burke, who was an Australian lawyer who works in the US on capital punishment ca cases. And he talked about how in his career and in the organization he works with, with helping prisoners on death row, they make one of their core principles, seeing their role as a spirit of service and I think that that's such a powerful idea so see your role as having a spirit of service and don't give up there's no plan B or planet B that our kids are going to go to there's nowhere you know everyone that you love in the world there's nowhere else that they are going to go and live there's nowhere else that your kids are going to live other than the world we've got now so we have to do everything we can to protect it and protect the amazing systems that we've got here, the amazing world, the beauty around us. So that's the lecture. I've given a very brief course review and a big picture, picture synthesis. And in the second part, some strategies for surviving in your careers. And I just wanted to finish by saying thank you. And I really enjoyed teaching this course and I wanted to say thank you for making I think the last time I will teach this course so enjoyable and inspiring so I really enjoyed you know chatting with many of you talking online uh, and yeah now looking at your group assignments and the great work you've done and I'm sure I'll be really impressed with your exams as well so uh, I find you guys really inspiring and I hope that you've enjoyed the course I, I well, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have because, yeah, it's been fun.